Hello, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, my name is Ali Mahdi. I'm a consultant orthopedic surgeon in Scotland and I would like you to well I'd like to welcome you to the resilience. So um, I'd like my other fellow panelists to introduce themselves. The purpose of this meeting, before before we get them to do that, the purpose of the meeting is that we have an interaction. We have an interaction about how we deal with uh, the external environment that we faced in during this crisis. But at the same time, how do we manage the external environment? How do we understand it? Not just cope, because coping strategies are about the external environment affecting us. How do we increase performance? We have to ask critical questions about what the future wants to be. And we hope that you know this forum will actually bring all that out through you. We want the answers from you. This is not a one-way interaction where we talk to you or for that matter, the panelists give suggestions. We would like to draw our opinion from yourselves so that we can make the future that we all want. So um, over to Matt. Matt, could you introduce yourself? Vivek, Omo, Steve, and Dimitrios. So, Matt, yes. my name is Nice to meet you all. Resilience meeting, the theme of sports and germs. And we are fortunate to have Steve Ingham and Dimitros talking to us today. But as an introduction to the session, I was just going to briefly highlight some of the importance of resilience and lead personal leadership when facing endurance challenges. Now, I'm currently a doctor and I'm working at the Nightingale Hospital. Some of you may have heard it all on the news. It's where all the additional complex COVID patients are being sent to in London. But the purpose today is to use sports as a means to enhance resilience. And so I'm going to briefly lead on to this theme by discussing some of the challenges I personally faced when I went to climb Everest in the Himalayas a couple of years ago. Now Everest is a big mountain. Not as risky as some, but still poses some complexes to the climber. I was leading a team, and there were numerous times during the trip, people's mental approach and personal resilience and motivation and energy dropped. And so I, I've always felt that in order to inspire a team, you have to set a clear vision of where you want to go. And that may be different for different individuals. And so that that common purpose can draw everyone in. And so I'll be interested to hear what people think, but having that common, eye, common sense of purpose of where you want to go, where everyone feels that they can aspire to after this terrible COVID crisis is finished, it will be interesting to see how people think that helps. And so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Steve Ingham, who is a director and performance scientist. He's helped support over a thousand athletes. Many have gone on to achieve world or Olympic medals, including athletes such as Janice, Jessica Ennis-Hill, Sir Stephen Redgrave and Sir Matthew, Matthew Pinsent. So I look forward to hearing everyone's views on how sports leadership and in personal resilience can help in a situation like we find ourselves in today. Steve, please. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Thank, thank you, you, Ali. Um, can I just check, would you like me to introduce myself and pause or introduce myself and continue um, on? Please introduce yourself and continue. This is like a wreath lecture where you talk mm -hmm. and everybody asks the questions and they, in fact, we bring in a little bit of a chat show element to it as well to gather opinions. So please continue. Wonderful. Um, so I just want to say thank you for the invitation. Uh, superb initiative. Um, it's, a, it's humbling to, to share some thoughts and insights from the world of performance. Uh, and a huge hat tip to you all working at the front line delivering, but, but or, or in support roles. Um, Briefly, my, my background is as a, a performance scientist, a physiologist by trade, having worked in elite sport for the last 25 years, uh, 
predominantly in the British Olympic system, um, with coaching, but providing sports science support to, to athletes. Over 200 athletes I've supported have won world or Olympic medals. Uh, part of that journey has been about learning about not only what we need to help with athletes in support of them, whether it's their training regimes or nutrition, whatever it might be, but we've also spent a lot of time thinking about ourselves, how we perform as, as individuals and as teams. And high performance teams is a big concept that, that we now develop companies with in, in supporting champions. Um, so if I, if I could share some slides with you, and hopefully this will, will come through and we can, we can get into some material. Um, I, I also want to probably just put a little bit of a disclaimer that, that I think that we have to be cautious. Can everyone see my slides okay? Uh, let me know, yeah. um, Ali, if you, you yeah. are having it's problems very clear. with that. Full yeah, screen. okay, great. Um, <clears throat> I, I think we need to be careful about taking a metaphor such as sports performance and applying it to different industries. We've spent a lot of time in performance sport learning from the, the likes of NASA, from the SAS, from ambulance workers, from air traffic control, these sorts of people that have got to perform under pressure and applying them to sport. However, I do feel as though if we are considerate of thinking about optimizing human performance, um, there are some methods that persist across systems and across cultures and across domains. So, so with that prelude in place, um, uh, th this to me is probably the dynamic that, that we need to be conscious of. So some of the techniques I'll, I'll apply to uh, I'll talk about today, um, they, they definitely relate to the elite athlete and they'll be involved in those. But actually I want to focus on many of the tactics that we would we'd actually pro provide support to the coach. Uh, so, so in some ways, we're, we're the coach uh, behind the patients. We're the, we're the people behind the, the athletes. Um, <clears throat> and what I've done is I've grouped uh, the, the seven tactics that I want to share with you today, seven practices that can enhance your capacity and, and provide you with an advantage that potentially can be uh, quite helpful to your ability to thrive under pressure. Uh, and I've grouped them into three uh, categories. Uh, and, and I'll give you my top tips within each one, specifically that I've identified and selected uh, based on what I think might be most relevant to the current circumstances and what perhaps you might be going through. Um, is it, now, I, I, a, a slight disclaimer here is that it's easy to, sh to jump to the shiny gadget or the new framework or the the latest model, but I, I make no apologies in starting off by covering brilliant basics because it's a, a framework or a model or a way of thinking is, is all very good and well, but if it's no good, if you haven't got some of the basics in place. Um, and so some of these are priorities. It's a snapshot view uh, and a bit of a whistle stop. And so with that disclaimer in place, I'll proceed. The, the priority for me is not about lung capacity or, or running faster or rowing faster here, is that a lot of our work in, in elite sport is about developing uh, clear thinking. How can we enable the, the athlete and the coach to be thinking clearly? And these seven tactics are helping you to, to enable you to be uh, thinking clearly under pressure. And the first tactic, the first tactic comes fundamentally to your sleep. Uh, a good night's sleep is the bedrock of high performance. And I would, having directed the science operations for the London and Rio Olympics uh, for Team GB, I would say that probably in the last cycle, uh, the, the work developing the sleep for athletes and coaches probably gave the biggest competitive advantage that we've seen uh, in any Olympic cycle. So very specifically, uh, that we're talking about executive functions, decision making of judgment, creativity and learning. We know that those can be severely impaired by sleep deprivation um, and less so to vigilance, strength, endurance, attention, memory scanning. But we do know that with a bad night's sleep, your decision making can be impaired. 
And so putting focus and attention to, to doing what you can to providing yourself with a good night's sleep. And the, 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 the biggest advantage that we have seen, the one that can really create momentum for people, is to whatever you are doing, to, to try and provide your mind and your body with a routine and regularity. And so that's a consistency. Now, my assumption is that you might not have regularity with what, everything that's going on. You might be going to bed at different times, but what you can potentially provide is, a, is routine. So following the same practices before you go to bed. And that provides what's known as a sleep transition, cueing your body in to, to allow you to get a good night's sleep. And so an example might be to be switching your emails off uh, in good time, to, to stopping using blue light uh, within an hour before you go to bed, journaling or providing some sort of reflection so that you're parking your thoughts and capturing some of that cognitive arousal. Potentially eating or drinking some protein uh, before you go to bed, that seems to affect your brain neurotransmitters. Uh, doing something that might relax you, whether that's reading a novel or, or a puzzle, for example. And then importantly, only going to sleep when you're tired. And that sounds blindingly obvious, but a lot of people think I must go to sleep because it's this time and if I don't go to sleep now, I'm not going to rest well. What we show is if when we're overloaded and we have high cognitive arousal is that going to sleep when you're tired is a much greater advantage to increasing your sleep efficiency. My next tip is that if you can't sleep, if you have cognitive arousal, if your mind is going, then get up, get up and move about. And it's better that you take a break from that rather than toss and turn and have what we, what we call um, unproductive sleep. Um, and you wake and you're, and you're not rested. So that's my top tip of getting up, moving about, perhaps having a snack, uh, and then going back to sleep when you're tired again. Better to have less sleep and it to be high quality. Now there are lots of things about sleep, but the other one that I like, that, and this is a small effect, so don't get carried away with this, but there's some lovely little re bit of research that reminding yourself of your purpose, your purpose in life, why are you here? Why are you doing what you're doing? Enhances sleep. And so at this time of crisis, I think this is highly relevant to align to that and think about what you're here to do um, and that that can in itself assure and settle your sleep. So that's tactic number one, get a good night's sleep. Secondly, um, is around nutrition. And there's all sorts of uh, um, rubbish out there on the internet about what you should and shouldn't eat at different times. Um, and if you look on the Daily Mail, you'll change your, your um, don't look at the Daily Mail, but if you do look at the Daily Mail, you'll see different opinions about the same different things. I'm gonna hone in again, one clear tactic of what are, we, what are we prioritizing when it comes to clear thinking? What's the one nugget of a bit of information that we would get our coaches to adopt in the Olympic village, in the Olympic arena. And it's centered around sugar. Um, and if there's one thing that there seems to be growing consensus on, it's avoiding simple sugars, particularly added sugars. And the effect that we're trying to minimize here, this is the blood glucose response over time, complex carbohydrates arise in blood glucose, or simple carbohydrates, we see this rise, shoot up, and then a lull in blood glucose afterwards. Importantly, this, this lull is associated with reduced concentration, impaired decision-making, increased tiredness, and a negative mood state, all poor to your own capacity to, to make good judgments. Uh, so, so in a sense, that if there's one simple change that you could make to your diet, and, and I'm cautious here because sometimes overloading people with too much information about changing a hundred different things uh, is, is a recipe for disaster. It's why New Year's resolutions don't work. But if there's one change that you could make to improve your thinking capacity during this time when you're going to make good judgments uh, and improve those judgments is to reduce the amount of simple sugars in your diet. Third is movement and exercise. And this is the final uh, tactic under the brilliant basics. And 
that there is a number of different things that you could be partaking in and are allowed to do in the various different lockdowns of going for a walk. You can see that these people here at least are observing two meters uh, uh, distancing, yoga, uh, resistance training, whatever activity you're, you're interested in doing. Um, pr predominantly, I would advise to you that under this auspice of developing our capacity for clear thinking, aerobic endurance exercise is the priority. And I'll explain particularly the reasoning for that is around the reduction in stress hormones that occurs post endurance exercise. It lowers your heart rate through, throughout the day. That in itself reduces the stress hormone response. And if you're triggered by something stressful during the day and you've done some endurance exercise at the start of the day, then you will see a, a blunted stress hormone, heart rate, cortisol, and uh, your anxiety uh, blunted because you've got a protective effect of it, endurance exercise. And that allows you to protect your cognitive thinking capacity. It maintains quality decision making. I would also make a, a, a couple of other points about endurance exercise or simply moving that what if you're sat down making judgments, breaking up prolonged periods of sitting at least increases uh, brain flow, uh, blood flow to the brain. If you can go outside and, and access light, then that can enhance the additive effect of getting exercise because it's a stimulant for the brain, particularly if you're tired. An interesting tactic that the Roman soldiers used to use, which was called solvitas perambulum, which means walk to solve. Maybe not whilst you're, you're talking to people, but, but if you're able to walk, you're, you're likely to be able to, to problem solve at a higher level. It activates the brain waves in slightly different ways. So walking to maybe when you're getting stuck, if you're stuck in judgment, then go out and take a walk. Endurance exercise might be the priority, but something is better than nothing. Uh, you will get an additive benefit uh, by doing something rather than anything in particular. So that's exercise, that's the third tactic, that's the end of the brilliant basics. Now I'm gonna move on to some, some mental skills that athletes would be using, but also coaches would be applying to themselves too. And the first one is what we would call a pre-mortem. Uh, we would also call this the what if scenario. And this is scenario planning based on, on the different risks and threats that you might be experiencing. So for example, the Olympics and Paralympics have been moved into next year. Athletes have, have had to delay their training. They've got another year to, to think about. And we've now got to start adapting to thinking, what if this happens? What if that, what if it moves again? And what we normally do is we would, we would almost imagine that everything is a disaster. Everything went wrong. We would then make a long list of everything that could go wrong. And then we would prioritize that list. And then we would start to create action plans around the most important fundamental area. And this doesn't mean that you can do everything on that particular list, but it's a, it's a healthy way of covering risk management. So for an athlete, what if I forget my trainers? What, I'm gonna do, what, it's gonna, what, it's gonna, um, what am I gonna do about it? And have a backup strategy for each of those. At the very simplest term, the plan of action identifies what could go wrong and what could you do to minimize the effect of the highest priority threats. And this particular technique has to be backed up with an action plan. If you have an action plan behind it, then you can start to create momentum and start to head those off. Now importantly, under a time of pressure, your brain gets very noisy and you start, start, things start to get quite cluttered in your head. And what this particular technique does is change the narrative from, I'm not prepared, what if this happens, what if that happens, to changing that inner record to, I've done everything I can to prepare given the time and the resources that I've got. And it changes from a negative spiraling thought process to a positive uplifting thought. The fifth tactic is to 
to think about acclimatizing your experiences. Sometimes we're often thinking about the future, whether we're going to get on or well or not. Uh, my slide there is apt to Matt's expedition. But we would acclimatize and acknowledge people's experiences by thinking about, well, if I, if I can get to the top of this mountain, then maybe, maybe that will, that, that, those skills and experiences can indicate that I can get to the top of the next mountain. And this is about you nurturing and recognizing your achievements. What is it that you have achieved already? Because those are going to be the most legitimate, most authentic indicators that you can take the next step, whatever that might be. The future is unknown, the future is uncertain, but the best indicator that you can succeed in the future is your experiences. So taking time to acknowledge your achievements, your accomplishments. Here's four questions that can potentially frame some of that thinking. What are your key achievements? Registering a couple of those, noting them down, recognizing the progress that you've actually made. When have you previously demonstrated resilience in the face of difficulties? So that's identifying your situational experience, because that can indicate that you can bounce back and show resilience again. How did you know that you delivered? So you've got some logic behind this, some, some objective understanding. And finally, what did you learn from these moments? And so that process of acknowledging your experiences builds your self-efficacy the confidence that you can achieve again and finally six as uh, no, the penultimate uh, point is is six managing in the moment because something will kick off we always know that something will go wrong in the olympic arena something will go wrong and they will have to manage in the given moment and we have a three-step process to, to gaining control um, in the moment. The first tactic is to de-escalate the situation. De-escalate by, by objectifying, asking yourself what objective um, observations can be made about the situation. Is the response that I'm experiencing credible? What are the emotions? And if you're taking a mindful moment to de-escalate the situation, you're primed, you're primed to take the next step, which is to normalize the situation. Is the incident normal? Just asking the question, even whether it's a yes or a no, allows you to get a, get a grasp on what next. Could it have been anticipated? And finally, to simplify, what is the single simplest solution that you could get behind? And can you visualize yourself delivering that particular solution. So rather than creating in the moment, let's do five different things to, to try and disperse the, the, the pressure of the situation or try and solve it. What's the one thing that you can do that can make a difference? And I said there were seven. Those six are things you can do in preparation uh, that can nurture your, your capacity. But the final one is after the event. And so this is about reflecting and debriefing, asking yourself uh, some key questions. What happened? What did you feel about the situation? What, could, what, make, what sense can you make about it? What else would you have done? Uh, what would you do differently if you would do again? This is something that all high performance teams will do after, after an event. If you don't take time to be debriefing and reflecting, then you won't be learning and developing your capacity to be effective uh, the next day. So those are my seven key tactics. Those are the seven that uh, persist for all athletes, whatever they might be, and, but also for the coaches and support staff and that, that will offer you some, some gain and some improvement in your performance uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. I appreciate this bit of a whistle-stop tour. I've got some, some contact details there if you'd like to get in contact, but also some other supporting material, particularly our podcast, which we have developed a couple of special episodes dedicated to supporting and championing people uh, during this, this particular crisis. So on that note, Ali and Matt, I'm going to stop sharing and 
hand back. Um, thank you, Steve, Dr. Steve Ingham, for going through that. That was amazing. My name is um, Omar Kunkwa. I am an associate dentist. I um, used to be a clinical lead for King's College. I'm just going to quickly go through very quickly. I'm sure that all of you would agree that was amazing, amazing session, Steve. So thank you so much for that. And as you said, it was a really quick run through. So I will encourage everyone to go ahead and reach out to Steve because I, I really believe it's actually, I'm also a coach as well. Um, I really believe it's actually the little things that will make a massive difference in this time, in this situation. So I'm going to try my best to go through all he said really briefly because we really want to give everyone an opportunity to ask questions because I think it's sometimes very well and good hearing this information which is brilliant but sometimes we have those specific questions that we want to speak to um, an expert especially someone who's worked with high performance team listen my research on well-being and performance as well has shown that there is an art to this so for wherever we are going through at the moment just knowing that we can learn something from this particular situation just to get better at whatever we do. So just to go through the brilliant basics that Steve, and, um, Steve mentioned, making sure we have clear thinking. So getting enough sleep, making sure you develop a clear routine that you can actually follow. And we're gonna be sending you out this tape so you can listen again, because there's so much, so much good stuff in there. Making sure you do things like journaling, making sure you relax just before you go to bed and making sure that you only go to bed when you're tired. I'm gonna ask you a little bit more about that because I think, oh my God, everyone says you need eight, nine, 10 hours of sleep. So I guess we're gonna ask the expert just now why that is. And reminding yourself of your purpose. I know every time I go out into clinic to see patients, um, I know that I always think, why am I doing this? But reminding yourself of a bigger and grander purpose for why we're doing what we're doing. Nutrition, big thing. I don't know about you, but I've stocked up on vitamins and everything possible suddenly. I've been really good at my vitamins, but making sure you really take care of yourself. As Ali always says to me, the first point of leadership is making sure you lead yourself properly. Even if you have a family, you've got to start with yourself and prioritizing yourself is key. Very difficult in tough situations. I appreciate that. Making sure you move and exercise. I think it's phenomenal when you mentioned the fact that aerobic and endurance exercise is what we need to do. That's interesting. I wanted to also ask you a question about doing things with med, um, yoga and Pilates. What are your thoughts on that? But the fact that you said it has a protective effect on your cognitive thinking. As um, clinicians here, we are all thinking on the spot in this very unprecedented time. So just some more information on that would be really great doing simple movements and walk to solve. So if you get your mind gets clouded, just go out for a walk and get some air and that may just clear up some things in your mind. Number four, um, doing a risk assessment, which we all, all do a risk assessment about, you know, what, it, what is it that um, has gone right, what could go right, what could go wrong. And we all do that in, in, in clinic, but just making sure you do that in your situation and actually taking it in and saying, I've done all, I've covered all, um, basis, I've thought of the bad and I've put in mit, um, things to mitigate that and making an action plan and climatize and acknowledge, listen, remembering where we've come from, what it is we have achieved. And I think for us so as high achievers, sometimes we can actually forget that, but actually that actually does a lot of good to us to remember that we have the power to move through the situation by going back and reflecting on what we have achieved. Key achievements and appraisals, I would call it an appraisal um, situation and experience. Gives you the confidence on what you've achieved so far. I'm coming up to the end because I know I'm short on time. Um, managing in the moment, because there are going to be things that actually happen in that moment that you won't you were never planned for, which is exactly what's actually happening with COVID-19. None of us planned for this. But what is it that we're going to do? De-escalate the situation, normalize it, and simplify it. It's so true. Sometimes it's, um, 
you can think of trying to do so many things, but as they say, going back to the basics is always the key to making a um, um, strong decision. And last but not the least, um, effective debriefing. We're going to send this recording out to you. That was just a quick run through to summarize all that we have learned today. But I just want to pass over now to, is it Ali, you are we going to pass over? Indeed, over. Indeed. As we um, go ahead, and I think he's the next speaker. But yes, thank you for listening. I hope that has really helped you guys. Thank you very much, Oba. And we will move indeed on to Dimitrios Spiridonidis, who is the program director of the executive MBA program of Warwick Business School. And he's an expert on leadership. Um, we have often found ourselves, I think, in the run up to the whole escalation of COVID in our workplace in an environment of volatility, ambiguity, but left uncertain, there seems to be a whole complex uh, system that is all around us. And for many of us, including myself, there have been emotions. Um, again, you know, it might have left us asking ourselves about what our purpose is, what, uh, whether we have, if you like, the power to influence or not, whether we are not, whether we are in a formal role or not, we might be wanting to ask ourselves, are we actually leaders? Do we have it in ourselves? Um, are we leaders or are we followers? What, where are we in this time of our people? So to answer the questions about leadership and followership and about managing one's own emotions, um, Dimitri Ross is going to tell us a bit more. And after that, Omar will summarize and we'll have questions and a discussion between ourselves. Uh, Dimitri Ross, welcome. Could you please introduce yourself again? Uh, yes, hi. Uh, can you can you all hear me? I mean, yeah? Okay, good. Uh, I don't know whether you can see me or not, but something something is happening with my camera here. Anyways, uh, my name is uh, Dimitrios Piridonidis. I'm a professor of uh, leadership and innovation at uh, Warwick Business School. And uh, uh, thank you for, for inviting me on, on this uh, very interesting uh, uh, podcast debate and so forth. Um, well, I mean, uh, let me let me try and put this into perspective. I think uh, the situation, this this situation, it's a it's a really complex one uh, that is uh, consuming um, uh, a lot of stakeholders at uh, all levels. Uh, you know, environmentally, legally, economic, socially, and, and so forth. And, uh, and 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 yes, I think I, I agree. It's, it's it's a major threat uh, at, at, at you know at, at very different levels, and it creates a lot of uh, disruption, cognitive disruption, psychological disruption, and, and of course emotional uh, uh, disruption, which of course keeps every, everybody on edge. Uh, and, and, and if you think about the crisis, this is the, this, this specific crisis, uh, what is really unique about it, it's, it, it's, in, it's uncertainty, yeah? So in past crises, in previous crises, say, let's think about, you know, a terrorist attack, a, uh, you know, wildfire, uh, you know, a flood, whatever, what, whatever. You know, the actual incident is relatively, uh, short from a few seconds to a couple of days with COVID is going on and will go on for the foreseeable future and so one of the challenges there for everybody is, is to understand that you know how do you onboard and offboard people uh, into crisis management uh, and because this is not to use to use to use you know vocabulary from from the, the, the you know from the world of sports, this is not a sprint. It's going to be a marathon, yeah. And uh, people, you need to take care of of, of your people. And um, so, on one of the challenges uh, for everybody is to understand how how to do that. Uh, you can't you can't go on working long hours, seven days a week. Uh, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna kill yourself. So, so basically, you need to understand how you maintain the right uh, operational rhythm, if you like. And and uh, and um, and the challenge here is that you need to understand 
that the goal for everybody, the goal here is to be stronger, longer, yeah? And the best way to do that is to uh, understand where you, as an individual, as a clinician, as a manager, as a, as a parent, as a friend, uh, have to uh, step back and, uh, and let others to kind of step in and carry on, yeah? So we need to, to kind of understand that, that flexibility in how we uh, try to uh, respond uh, to the crisis. Now, you see, one of the common mistakes that uh, we see in many organizations is that a crisis, this crisis is a crisis because it creates some sort of a threat to the, our organizations or at the system level, if you like, and it can be a threat to your reputation and financial threat, a, you know, physical health, you name it. But the way that we try to solve this, I think, is we, we forget that this kind of crisis cannot be solved by one person alone. You have to work together as a team. Uh, but if you see about CEOs or people that sit at the strategic capital of the organization, their national style is one of uh, dominance rather than one of uh, collaboration. So, so the, the actual natural competitors, if you like, they, they compete in the marketplace, they, they have competed hard with their peers to get where, 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 they, where they are. But this is the, the, this is the situation that we need to work with others to embrace collaborations and, and you know, and engage in concertive action. Think, for example, what happened in, in Italy. Yeah? Uh, when, when a hospital in Italy realized that they were running out of valves for ventilators needed by the most you know, uh, severely affected by the COVID-19 patients, the solution came from a local startup that managed to experiment with uh, a 3D technology and use 3D printing to manufacture the valves. So it's in, in such a difficult situation, what I'm trying to explain is that we need to work um, uh, together because you're not going to overpower the coronavirus. We're not going to overthink it. And of course, we cannot negotiate uh, with it. And whether we can deal with it or not, it, it depends on whether we can act collectively and, uh, and, and consistently during the crisis. And then the other thing, and I'm going to leave it there, once we, once we, once we manage to understand how we respond, how, how, we, yeah, how we respond to the crisis, we need to also understand how we can recover from, from the crisis, not necessarily in terms of what's happening today, but what will happen in four months, if and whether the virus will come back. And for that type of preparation, you need a lot of people to work uh, uh, together in a collective manner. It, and it might be that today you are leading on a job, but tomorrow someone else has to step in to let you know what you have to do for, for your future. Uh, so I think, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it uh, there. And uh, I hope that, uh, you know, meet uh, uh, your uh, expectations. And uh, yeah. I think that's uh, that, that, that's for me. Thank you, thank you, guys. Thank you, Mistress, for just shedding some light on in terms of from a leadership perspective. Um, Dimitri mentioned the fact that um, we're in a position of uncertainty, and this uncertainty is ongoing. So there seems to be no end in that sense so no one's on everyone's unsure of when the ending is coming and so um, as a leader which we all are whether we have the title of leader or not in our own respect leaders and i think that's one of the reasons why this resilience group was set up to understand that this is not a sprint but more of a marathon so managing yourself as a leader is key to be able to um, overcome this situation, which surely we will. 
And he stated the fact as a leader, you need to create some sort of meaning. I guess also that um, goes with what Steve was saying about you need to create a purpose behind this. And this is fundamental for your mental well-being as a person as well, but also to see a purpose in it to grow and become stronger through it. It's very difficult, but it's something we must all do. And understanding and asking ourselves different questions as clinicians, what it is we want our, 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 our clinical work to look like in the now and in the future. Um, you mentioned one key thing about the fact that our style of leadership, if you're in a leadership position or you are, um, don't particularly have the title, but you're still a leader, our, our leadership style must change from a um, down approach or hierarchy approach to a collaborative form of leadership. So my question is, how is that going to change for you moving forward in your organization? Um, but one of the main things I know is leading self actually can change that dramatically. So I hope that summarizes um, some of what Dimitra said. We are actually, I hope it simulated some food for thought in your mind um, surrounding these issues. And we are actually going to open now to some questions. Is that right, Ali? Absolutely right. So um, yeah, over to Ali. Uh, Demetrios, I will start off, just sort of, I, I will move the motion to say, are we leaders or followers or are we both? Mm. And we'll try and get an opinion from the floor after that. Is it a question for me? Yes, it's a question for you. How would you say yeah. that we are leaders or followers and how would you say that we are actually both? Whatever position we're in. Well, I mean, uh, it, it, it does depend on the situation within which you try to identify what you are and what you do. So to give you, to give you an example uh, coming from uh, the way that the UK managed to, is managing to um, respond to the crisis, during the early stages we see some form of political leadership coming from the top, you know, um, Boris Johnson, you know, giving daily uh, conferences try to kind of uh, uh, inspire in the nation. But then over time that responsibility moved to someone else and Boris Johnson then were becoming a follower. And if, if you see, if, if, if we think about the context of, uh, you know, taking care of uh, uh, the severely ill uh, uh, population, the people who are becoming leaders are the people who are leading at the front then. And political leadership follows not those. It does depend on the context within which you try to uh, to answer your question, uh, Ali. So uh, as you know, uh, leadership is context dependent. Uh, so it might be that today you are leading your workforce, but uh, tomorrow you need to follow someone else uh, who has the knowledge, the ability, the capacity, the strength uh, to do a job that you might not be able to do, and, and vice versa. So it does depend on uh, the responsibilities and the tasks that we have to uh, do perform and so forth. So, so, uh, so, so what I'm to say, you are both depending on the, on the situation, yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay, brilliant. On this note, we have Vivek, you please... Uh, yes, hello. Yeah, thank you, question. Yeah. Sorry, I haven't uh, managed to introduce myself yet. I'm Vivek Srivastava, I'm one of the consultant cardiac surgeons at Oxford. Uh, my job was to keep an eye on the chat box, and I think Samina Malik has just uh, agreed with that comment from Dimitrios about us being both... Be followers and leaders, people who are good followers emerge as good leaders who in turn are able to understand the emotional needs of their followers. That's absolutely right. Um, one of the questions from Abhay Singh Rathor is to Steve Ingham. How do you support someone who is struggling with negative thought process and cannot effectively manage the fourth point, which is effectively your pre-mortem, I think you mentioned, any strategies that you can yeah. advise people about that thing when when we when we're dealing with emotions when we try to understand emotions i think we need to understand that uh, i think it's a very simple uh, uh, idea but i think it's a very strong idea it's the perception of an event that creates the emotions 
that people feel and act as amplified. So when people are... are Demetrius, sorry, can I just ask, I think your volume might be a bit, a bit low. Could you increase it? Thank you. You might need to be closer to the mic, that's all I suppose. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Thank you. So what I'm trying to say is, I think uh, the very first thing that you have to do is try to understand why people exemplify this type of behaviors. Because usually, emotions happen to us momentarily, but it's it's the perception of an event that creates that type of emotion. So mm -hmm. when we're dealing with emotions, when we try to become more intelligent about our emotions and the emotions of others, we need to understand what is the event that triggered this specific emotion? And then that can help us then to understand where that person is coming from and how we can support that person to kind of move outside of the negative. Yeah. And then of course, you know, you need to engage with all sorts of behaviors from coaching, mentoring, uh, effective communication, support, and so forth. Thank you, Demetrius. Steve, would you like to comment on that? So specifically around um, trying to break a negative uh, thought process and was the, being the question, I, wasn't quite under, I didn't quite understand the fourth point, but I'll, I'll, I'll try it as best I can, acknowledging that um, a negative thought spiral can, can be hugely contextual. And so the, the tips and thoughts might not land and it might not be appropriate to, to a given person's uh, situation. Uh, the, the three, uh, the, the, not forgetting that the brilliant basics are definitely going to help you. Uh, a good night's sleep helps you get into a good mood. Uh, having, having a lull in the afternoon after a sugary lunch is going to create a negative spiral. So let's not forget those things. But in terms of some of the mental skills that, that, that are extremely effective for people that could help uh, to almost give a, a clue first to, to try and externalize it and the, the technique there is being mindful and so in mindfulness you simply acknowledge and recognize I'm, I'm, I'm going through a negative thought process or that's interesting that's curious that I'm experiencing that um, as opposed to feeling it you're, you're externalizing it and letting it pass through you. And that's, that's, an, that's perhaps a first stage response of just pausing, the, slowing things down and being mindful that you've experienced something like that. Uh, the second and third are probably inspired by Viktor Frankl, uh, the, the psychiatrist who is in Auschwitz um, in, and taken from man's search for meaning, when he's talking about that between a stimulus and a response, there is a choice. And, and so in the middle of that, you get the opportunity to act or make uh, a change. So the first, I, first technique that would fall from that would be to, to differentiate what's within your control and what's out of your control. We spend a lot of emotion, we spend a lot of stress and time and worry uh, about things that we have no control over. And for, for an athlete, that means not worrying about your opposition. You can't do anything about what they're doing necessarily, but you can control what you can control. Differentiating those, and then the things that are within your control start to create some actions behind. And without overloading you with thoughts and frameworks here, I would again give you that simple technique of, of perhaps at the end of the day, or perhaps at the start of the day, to be, to be writing down actively, what, what's the one thing that I would be pleased with if I achieved today? What's the one thing that I can do to progress? Or potentially, what's the one thing that would give me joy today? And Something as simple as that. And if you've written, down, written that down last thing at night, you can park your thoughts and hopefully that would box it off. But then potentially you can pick that up and do that first thing in the morning. First things first. And then your day is already set up well. You've already achieved the thing that's going to give you progress and, and joy. So I'll, I'll, part, I'll stop there in case anyone wants to comment or contribute. Thank you, Steve. 
I think we have uh, Dr. Hilary H. Kumb from Oxford, who's a consultant anesthetist with uh, plenty of experience working in deprived sub-Saharan Africa, who also has a point to make here. Hilary, are you still here with us? Uh, right. you want to... Yes, I'm here. Sorry, I've got a poor, um, poor connection, so no video um, from my end. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, we can hear you, yeah. Hilary. Thank you You're for it. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. Was it was it about the, the the welfare stuff you wanted me to comment or or about um I just wanted to check which which part of our conversation you wanted me to speak about. Oh, please go ahead and talk. This is all about okay. talking. So please go. All right. Um, thank you. Um, I guess um, I just picked up um, on the uh, on the well being kind of emotional, handling the emotional ups and downs, so forth. Um, uh, and and just from within our department, um, we I, I would say as a department in Oxford, we woke up to this um, in anaesthetics about five to six weeks ago. I think intensive care were ahead of us, as were infectious diseases. Um, and there was quite a shockwave through our department as we looked at what was happening in Italy and had been happening in China. And then about four to five weeks ago, as we were looking at the London hospitals, and one of the things that um, uh, a group of people in, in the department did very, very early on was to set up some, some kind of emotionally protective strategies for the department. We talked to the psychologists early. Um, we set up a, uh, a peer support group, which was led by one of my colleagues who'd, who'd seen it working elsewhere. And we put in some place um, some functions for those who were self-isolating uh, or shielding, uh, which is a particularly difficult role um, for, for everybody in this um, situation, but in particular for intensivists and anaesthetists who, who feel they should be on the front line, but have been advised not to be. Um, so I, um, I just wanted to comment really that I've been, very, I've been very impressed with how the department and our trust um, following on from that have, have supported us in terms of allocating psychological support um, uh, to, to cope with the sort of immediate emotional stuff. And a lot of the tools um, that we've been hearing about from Steve Ingham, um, I'm, I'm really encouraged to hear are, are similar to, <laughs> to some of the things that we've, we've, we've been trying to put in place around advice on sleeping and um, mental mapping, uh, pre-mortems and, and acknowledgement of experience and so on. So I, I feel like we must be somehow on the right lines. Uh, that's great. Thank you, Hilary. I think there was another question from Chintan Singh about the, about some of the team members not behaving properly, effectively that, and trying to make their team dysfunctional. And there's been some exchanges as in a response to that from Jill, did you respond to Chintan? Thank you for that. This is what we need. This is what we need, uh, the interaction. But do you mind, this people may not be reading the chat boxes. Do you mind responding to that? Okay, can you for hear everyone, me okay? Please? Yes, okay. we can. And Thank you. I think some of this does span from, from scientific work, but often um, it, it's our natural instinct to try and convince the people who are uh, most obstructive in our teams that we feel that we need to bring everybody with us but actually the effort that it takes, if you imagine those people on a, on a bell curve, you know, the people at the back, the effort to bring them with you um, means that you're, you actually risk losing the people who were with you all along. And, and I've certainly experienced those sorts of situations and, and it's very easy to get drawn out into the rabbit hole of trying to make sure you've got everybody with you. But actually, if you've got a third of the group with you, and keep moving forward you know it's human nature to go with the flow to some degree and if, if you can try to convince the people who are perhaps just off the back of the bell curve you know look for the people halfway down your group in terms of followership and if you invest more time in them and bring them with you eventually the miscreants will either drop off the back if they're so you know so obstructive that they're they're never going to be team players or they will naturally want to be part of the crowd and move with you. And that's been my experience. I know it might not fit in every clinical situation, um, but I think there's something in investing in the people who are already at least going in the right direction rather than disproportionately investing in the others. Thank you, Jill. Thank you. I should have asked you to introduce yourself. I've gone back to the chat box and I understand you are an army officer. 
and uh, currently a part-time reservist and deputy commander of the Royal Military Academy at Sanders. Welcome. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for joining in. And I know Chintan who asked the question is a consultant pediatrician in London. Right. Any other questions uh, that or anyone else wants to make a comment because we are very close to finishing time. I think it's been a good session from my point of view. Did anyone else want to make any comments, last comments? Uh, may I please? Yes, so. I'm Dr. Samina Malik from Pakistan. Could you Hello, Samina. Hi. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ali Mehdi, for inviting me. Uh, I just wanted to share that uh, about teamwork, that if we want to go faster, we can walk alone or run. But if we want to go farther, we must go with the team. So keeping the team with you will make you go farther. Although you can go, go and reach the target earlier if you go alone, but it is better to go together with the team and reach farther to higher targets. Fantastic. What a fantastic thank you. thought. Fascinating. Um, I would like to thank everybody for being with us. And on that note, I will ask Vivek to introduce next week's program and leave you um, with our very best wishes to keep safe and healthy until we see you next week. And do spread the word. We want to be with you and assist you all the way through. Steve Dimitrios, it has been a fascinating session. And I sincerely hope that you'll be able to join us again. And hopefully, you know, we will put your word out and give that resilience to people. Um, but Vivek, could you please introduce next week's program and then, you know, um, yes. we wish everybody the best. Yes. Thank you very much, Steve. And thank you, Demetrios. Thank you. And before we split up, I will leave this lingering on. So this is uh, the talk we have organized for next week, which is the 15th of April. And you have already heard from Dr. Hilary Edgecombe, who is a consultant anesthetist, who's going to, who has done some work in Sub-Saharan Africa. And she's going to speak on resilience in low resource conditions, which she has much experience with. And we also have a second speaker again on following her who is Dr. Surja Datta, who is a senior lecturer at the Oxford Brookes University. He is uh, someone who has research interest in innovation and creativity. And he talks of, uh, about creativity and innovation in times of turbulence. So I think they're both going to be very, very good talks, very relevant and very pertinent to the current situation. Again, it's on, sorry, I should have said 22nd of April uh, uh, at six o'clock. And again, that's uh, approved for one CPD by the Royal College of Surgeons. If you email us, then the or register, pre-register, then the Royal College Register is updated with your email addresses for that. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. And please do spread the word around, as Ali has already said. And on that note, in the spirit of the today program in the morning, I would say goodbye.